Hi everyone. My name is Hoi Feng Poon. Uh, I lead uh, biomedical NLP research and Microsoft uh, research. Uh, today, I'm very excited to be here to tell you a little bit about our recent work on machine reading for precision medicine. I'll start by introducing precision medicine and explain a little bit why NLP and in particular machine reading can play a key role in this burgeoning new field. Of course, uh, there will be, we'll be facing uh, many machine learning challenges and I will uh, sh present a few sort of really exciting uh, frontiers such as uh, self supervision and domain specific for training. I'll conclude by showing you some of the end to end potential application areas. In the ideal world, we want every patient to be able to respond to the treatment they have been prescribed, as signified by the blue person on the left uh, graph here. In the real world, unfortunately, many of the patients actually do not respond to the treatment, as signified by the red person here. Of course, this is a well-known problem in uh, biomedicine, and the challenge used to be that we don't have the fine-grained high definition feature that can allow us to distinguish between the blue from the red priority. Having of big data in medicine promised a change for the good. And cancer genomic is a poster trial for this. Uh, from cancer biology, we know that by uh, the mutation. And so with the tumor genomics, we are literally spring at the source code for the cancer and can in principle distinguish patient down to the individual level. Another disruption is the rapid digitization of medical in the electronic uh, which can provide us with uh, longitudinal high definition uh, patient trajectory. Now, this is very exciting, but big data also carry uh, significant challenges in information overload. To uh, understand, to introduce uh, human genomic information, we need to understand uh, what those mutation means, uh, are they functional, uh, what do the mutated gene originally do, and what are the, how impact the drug response, and so forth. A lot of this information is scattered in a vast and rapidly growing literature. For example, every minute I'm talking here, there are two new papers pop up in the pump, and every day there are 4,000 new papers, and every year a million. And currently, to navigate all this information is primarily done uh, manually. This uh, so-called molecular tumor board, where you have a room full of uh, trying to look at uh, collectively look at the mutation for a given cancer patient and try to decipher uh, what uh, those uh, gene mutation means and what will be the actionable treatment regimens. In the U.S. alone, every year there are close to two million new cancer patients, and in the whole world there are. Uh, 15 million of So this is high level. On the flip side, uh, clinical research such as uh, drug development also face uh, certain challenges. For example, FDA essentially approved the same number of drugs every year, but uh, the cost for uh, uh, developing a, a single FDA approved drug have uh, skyrocketed to billions of dollars is to conduct this kind of large-scale uh, clinical trial where you need to compare the drug efficacy uh, with the new drug versus the standard of care. Now, by definition, a low standard of care uh, information uh, are essentially the, the available already in the electronic medical records. Companies like Flatiron have shown that it's actually possible to curate those information from the EMRs and then provides uh, sub comparable sufficient statistics for the control arm uh, to create this uh, so-called uh, synthetic control or virtual control. And that could potentially significantly reduce the, the costs uh, for drug development and speed, up, uh, uh, and speed up the trials. However, the majority of those information uh, actually scattered in the free text uh, clinical notes and currently, this, is, uh, the, this information is uh, completely done uh, manually, which can cost uh, 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 hours for a single patient. So this is, again, uh, highly uh, non-scalable. So this has motivated our research agenda in Project Handover, where we aim to develop machine reading technology that can help accelerate uh, unlocking those information 
uh, from biomedical text. For example, given a piece of uh, text from the PubMed paper, we might want to extract the relevant uh, entities such as uh, gene, mutation, and drugs from the text. More importantly, we want to, want the to equip the machine with uh, enough uh, sort of uh, reading competency so that it can understand that this piece of text actually describes a relation among this uh, drug gene mutation entity. For example, uh, if a tumor has this uh, EGFR LA158 mutation, then gefitinib might be applicable to this patient. From the literature, an overarching goal is to extract a PubMed scale knowledge graph where the notes are essentially important biomedical entities such as drug gene mutation, uh, disease, and symptoms. And the, and the edge or hyper edges are the relation, for example, like gene regulation and also precision oncology uh, treatment response. From the uh, medical notes, and a uh, really exciting uh, direction is to uh, extract those uh, population level real world evidence, which contain the high definition longitudinal patient journey, uh, starting from you know, diagnosis all the way to treatment and outcome. Now this is very exciting, but there are many challenges uh, uh, face in, uh, that we face in machine reading. Uh, for example, uh, authors tend to be very creative in figuring out uh, different ways to stay the, essentially the same thing. So here uh, uh, actually a few ways to describe the relation between the tumor suppressor P53 and the apoptosis uh, pathway BCL2. Specifically, the P53 can actually inhibit uh, the BCL2 pathway. In the small corpus of a couple thousand abstracts, there is already an extremely long tail of uh, keywords that can be used that has been used to uh, express uh, this kind of negative uh, regulation event. On the flip side, the same expression may also represent actually completely different things. For example, uh, one of the really amusing things uh, when I first look at uh, biomedicine is to find out there's actually a gene called PDF. As you can imagine, the machine reader can scratch its head trying to figure out whether this is referred to a gene or text format or maybe probabilistic density function or so forth. Now, obviously, ambiguity and uh, variation are really the bread butter uh, challenge uh, in uh, natural language processing. But in biomedicine, we also face some uh, unique challenges that has been uh, uh, underexplored in the past. For example, in the mainstream NLP, the focus of information extraction has been on relatively simpler relations such as binary relation involving two uh, arguments and they typically focus on short text spans such as single sentences. In biomedicine, however, we need to extract, you know, a lot more complex relation such as uh, it, the, this kind of precision oncology response uh, related to drug gene mutation. Uh, and then people obviously will also ask about what cancer types are involved here, uh, what's the evidence type, and how strong is the evidence, and whether it's human trial, mice, uh, mice trials, and so forth. And uh, this kind of complex relation typically span multiple sentences and even across, uh, you know, paragraphs and so forth. And in biomedicine, we also lost a really powerful tool uh, that is uh, crowdsourcing. In in uh, um, in uh, machine learning, right? Uh, crowdsourcing has been uh, instrumental in actually collecting, generating a large training set to power uh, recent advance in deep learning. For example, to create an image net corpus for computer vision, and in NLP to create resources such as like the squads uh, for question answering and so forth. Now, unfortunately, in biomedicine, uh, annotating those uh, examples would require deep domain expertise, uh, which is uh, could be very hard to do uh, in crowdsourcing. For example, imagining asking George Turker to annotate, to interpret a cancer genomic paper, or to uh, uh, interpret a CT scan, uh, uh, that, that would be pretty hard. So this has motivated us to focus on uh, exploring an alternative machine learning paradigm called self-supervised learning. So in standard supervised learning, 
uh, we expect to uh, essentially create this uh, input output examples, right? That become the bottleneck for annotation. Now in self-supervised learning instead, we're trying to leverage the freely available domain knowledge to essentially hallucinate or create a scale, uh, a lot of noisy training example on the unlabeled text. So this has been uh, essentially our overarching research theme in Project Hanover, where we show some promising uh, progress in uh, starting from you know, uh, fundamental biology, such as gene regulation, and more recently to uh, translational medicine or open science. For example, to uh, let me start with a really simple example uh, uh, of self-supervision called uh, distance supervision, right? For any type of important uh, knowledge or information, chances are people start by, you know, trying to really curate them. For example, because of those uh, gen genetic uh, regulation of pathway are so important to uh, precision oncology um, and the uh, Natural uh, Cancer Institute uh, actually mobilized the nature editors to try to create a knowledge base of this kind of regulation event. So each row is essentially uh, a uh, regulation event such as P53 can inhibit B-cell 2. Now, unfortunately, after two years, uh, uh, this, this, uh, the, the editors uh, quit because uh, this can be very time consuming and laborious. And the database uh, quickly uh, go, go uh, obsolete. But here, the idea is that can we uh, leverage this uh, freely available knowledge base to try to create some uh, uh, label example to bootstrap the machine reading. Is that knowing a particular relation between P53 and BCL2 doesn't by itself constitute a training example. But if we look at the unlabeled text and notice that these two genes actually happen uh, nearby, then we can potentially uh, actually uh, take a leap of faith to, to imagine that uh, this uh, piece of text might be actually talking about uh, this uh, known relation between these two genes. Now, in this way, you can uh, actually automatically uh, create a very large uh, 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 training uh, data set uh, essentially for free. Now, of course, the two genes may also appear nearby for uh, many other reasons. So the noise, uh, uh, obviously, in this uh, annotation. But one thing to notice is that statistical learning has a sort of like built-in uh, capability to withstand uh, some of the noise. And so as long as a signal outweighs the noise, then we can uh, es essentially get the learning goal. More importantly, uh, we don't have to stop at just uh, distance supervision, but can actually incorporate additional knowledge uh, and constraint to uh, actually uh, uh, improve the annotation. So for example, given those uh, four PDF mentions at a priori, we have no idea whether they refer to gene or, uh, for, or something else. But one thing we can leverage is a linguistic phenomenon called co-reference. All this, we notice that all this mention, uh, essentially identical mention that occur nearby, then we can actually start to hypothesize that they are probably uh, co-reference, uh, uh, which means that they essentially relate, uh, refer to the same entity. We still don't know whether they refer to gene or not, but we now reduce four uncertain uh, kind of decision into essentially a single one. Now, additionally, we can leverage another linguistic phenomenon called apposition and to start hypothesizing that uh, peptide deformulates probably mean the same as uh, PDF uh, that is in the parentheses uh, next to it. So in this way, we can now tie the, the four PDF mentioned also to, with uh, this uh, peptide formulas. Additionally, we, we can leverage the, the domain uh, ontology, such as the gene ontology, and find out that peptide formulas, in fact, is indeed uh, an uh, alias uh, for uh, the PDF gene. And unlike PDF, peptide formulas is a much longer expression that is uh, uh, much less uh, uh, ambiguous. So by combining all of this piece of information, we can now uh, be uh, highly confident that all this PDF actually is likely a gene reference. Now we mentioned that it's uh, pretty unscalable to expect uh, to a uh, human expert to try to give you, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, label examples. 
but we can always, you know, buy them a lunch and ask them to spend like 20 minutes and think about a domain and give you some sort of rules and, and, and patterns about the domain. Now, obviously, all of this uh, potential source of self supervision they could be noisy and they uh, could be even uh, contradicting with each other. But we have a very powerful tool in prophetic logic that can essentially combine all of this noisy and potentially contradictory uh, information uh, into a coherent uh, sort of probabilistic framework. So specifically, we can imagine representing those known labels that you wish you know, right, as latent variables such as the Z here, and then represent the cell supervision as the factors in a graphical model. For example, the Z1 may to uh, the, the uncertain question whether the first PDF mention uh, is a gene mention or not, and Z2 is the, whether the second PDF is a gene mention or not, and the F factor uh, may represent actually the uh, domain knowledge that if this uh, two uh, 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 mentions are uh, co-reference, then they should be agree with each other whether they are gene or not. So uh, altogether, this basically defines a joint probability distribution uh, over this unknown labels by injecting all those uh, uh, prior knowledge from the cell supervision factors. We can call on state-of-the-art probability inference uh, algorithm to essentially compute the marginal probability uh, for all these ZIs, and then we can treat them as uh, essentially probability labels to use to treat uh, to to train. Uh, 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 deep neural networks. Now, the, the deep neural network training from even this uh, initially noisy labels may be able to start to uh, uh, correctly uh, detect a lot of the patterns in, in, the, in the domain. And in turn, it can actually fix those uh, some of those uh, uh, initially uh, noisy uh, labels in a variational EM process to make the, the uh, deep neural network uh, to be more and more accurate. So we, uh, per, uh, in this way, we propose uh, this unifying framework for incorporating all these uh, uh, diverse sources of self-supervision uh, called the uh, deep probabilistic logic to essentially use probabilistic logic to represent uh, the self-supervision from prior knowledge and use it to uh, automatically bootstrap uh, deep learning. More recently, we extend deep probabilistic logic with uh, structure learning and active learning capability so that it can actually bootstrap from just a very small set of cell supervision uh, that uh, require initial uh, uh, manual creation and then to automatically actually propose new cell supervision. So essentially in, in, in stand up, uh, uh, in, in addition to actually trying to hallucinate a lot of noisy training example, um, this way, we are actually trying to hallucinate the hallucination scheme uh, 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 altogether. And we show that this and can actually uh, uh, bootstrap from a very small set of initial seed cell supervision and learn to produce a very effective uh, additional cell supervision to train a very accurate uh, uh, prediction model uh, down the road. So, so far, we have talked about how do we incorporate prior knowledge to um, actually bootstrap the machine learning, but we can also incorporate uh, those uh, domain knowledge and, and constraints into the new uh, architecture uh, by itself. For example, we are one of, among the first to introduce a graph new network into NLP application by proposing a graph uh, LSTM. So the motivation is to try to incorporate a lot of those uh, syntactic uh, and other linguistic uh, uh, analysis that can help us to model long-range uh, dependency uh, in, in the text. So essentially, we are using those uh, linguistic structure to uh, actually uh, focus the attention, uh, uh, long-range attention uh, for to facilitate deep learning. More recently, we have been uh, uh, motivated by the challenge in uh, extracting all those uh, complex relation spanning uh, 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 paragraphs. We propose uh, this uh, multi-scale representation learning, which is essentially trying to model uh, essentially partial, sort of like partial uh, uh, mention uh, of the relation 
uh, in sort of local linguistic units such as uh, sentences or, or paragraphs, and then combine all this mention level sub representation into a document level, entity level representation to uh, support the final uh, extraction uh, predictions. And more recent, most recently, we also start to exploring uh, uh, language model per training, which is essentially a, a form of a task agnostic uh, self supervision. So, given the unlabeled text, uh, it, we essentially try to hide some of the words and then ask the language model to bring them back. And in this way, we can actually force this model to capture a lot of the interdependent uh, semantic uh, uh, relations uh, among those uh, uh, words. So um, this, this has been uh, actually demonstrated a lot of remarkable success. But the, uh, once again, the mainstream NLP have been focusing on general domain text, such as the uh, newswire and the web, in actually a fierce uh, arm race in trying to scrape our more larger data set from the web and training uh, our larger models. And there has been a lot of uh, benchmarks and leaderboards uh, created. Now, this is very exciting, but when we look at the biomedicine do, uh, domain, we notice that the biomedical text actually can be very different from the general domain text. But unfortunately, the, the biomedical per training has been uh, generally underexplored, and there has been no uh, significant uh, sort of leaderboard or comprehensive benchmark uh, for biomed NLP. So, um, uh, and, and, and also the pre prevailing assumption uh, when people look at uh, biomedical per training is that um, um, biomedical per training can benefit from actually the general domain per training. And the uh, standard practice is to start from the general domain. Uh, language models uh, such as BER, and then trying to continue uh, portraying uh, on biomedical text. We now this obviously make perfect sense if your target domain uh, have very unlabeled text, so that you want to on the transfer learning uh, from the general domain text to your target domain text. Now in biomedicine, however, uh, this uh, assumption actually breaks down. Uh, in the PubMed abstract alone, we have more text uh, than the wiki plus books that has been used to train the original bird. And if you add the full text articles, then we get another order, order of magnitude more text uh, than, than just the abstract. So this has motivated us to uh, explore an alternative uh, pre-training paradigm by essentially generating a fresh uh, bio, uh, vocabulary uh, purely for uh, the biomedical domain. Then uh, conduct the per training from scratch uh, in biomedical text only. So this allows us to create a PubMed BER model, uh, which actually outperform all prior language models uh, on a wide range of uh, biomedical uh, NLP tasks. So one key reason why uh, the uh, PubMed BER performs so well is because that uh, can uh, if you look at the vocabulary. Uh, in various uh, BER model, for example, right? Um, you will notice that uh, a lot of the biomedical uh, terms actually have been treated as uh, second-class citizens in the general domain vocabulary. And, uh, they, and as a result, they will be actually, uh, you know, uh, shattered into this kind of uh, essentially meaningless subwords, which make uh, biomedical training uh, pretty hard to uh, actually acquire the, the biomedical specific uh, meaning. And on top of that, you also have to essentially unlearn all those irrelevant uh, sort of general domain uh, uh, semantics. So, so um, that's part of the reason why uh, uh, PubMed uh, by actually creating the vocabulary uh, from scratch just for biomedical uh, 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 literature uh, can actually perform much better than uh, starting from the general domain bird. So we release uh, our PubMed bird model, and uh, it's very exciting to see the, the interest from the community. Uh, it's been downloaded for uh, over half a million uh, uh, times uh, since uh, last August. And we also uh, released the Blur, uh, which is a comprehensive benchmark and, and the first, the first uh, biomedical NLP leaderboard, and we hope to uh, is, uh, lower the entry barrier. Uh, for getting into this uh, very exciting field of uh, biomedical NLP. We also apply this uh, to COVID uh, biomedical search 
and uh, find out that actual domain specific per training uh, can substantially improve the, the uh, accuracy and uh, in in uh, search relevance. And uh, we also attain the top performance in this official uh, track COVID uh, evaluation. Now, these are all very exciting, but none of this uh, matter much un until we can actually translate this into end-to-end -end, uh, application uh, impact uh, in, uh, in precision medicine. So despite all the hype uh, about AI in medicine, um, human biology is very complicated and even the most sophisticated AI can be primitive in uh, many of the biomedical applications. So instead of shooting directly for end-to-end uh, -end automation, we instead trying to explore this uh, a sweet spot in human computer symbiosis uh, when uh, essentially we want the computer to play foot soldier and take over a lot of the boring, repetitive uh, part of the work that also happen to be tend to be uh, most time consuming. For example, if you uh, imagine the, the whole curation effort as a pyramid, for example, the 4,000 new paper uh, from PubMed uh, uh, to read today, and your task is trying to find out a few facts uh, that is uh, relevant for precision ontology. Uh, on, on ontology. So um, no, notice that the, this uh, obviously to uh, actually finding all those, you know, a uh, 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 few some needle findings uh, from this giant haystack uh, uh, could be quite uh, challenging, but most of the haystack actually doesn't even look remotely like the needle that you're looking for. So even noisy self-supervised machine reader can potentially be able to filter out the majority of those haystack and then present the human expert with a few you know, candidate needles from which the human expert can very quickly uh, validate them uh, and, and complete the uh, curation process. So uh, develop a prototype system of uh, precision oncology motivated by the American Tumor Board, where we essentially uh, 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 turn the curation into a validation process uh, when uh, the human curator can essentially look at each candidate facts uh, in the context and can quickly validate it uh, uh, by a click of uh, a button. So uh, we have been collaborating with the Jackson Lab, uh, which had developed a clinical knowledge base for precision oncology uh, with uh, uh, tens of thousands of users. Um, so far, they have been uh, focusing on uh, essentially uh, manual curation, and this can be very time consuming and laborious. For an example, a uh, drug, for example, um, the manual curation process uh, typically identify hundreds of potentially uh, relevant papers, which can easily take over an, a thousand hours to curate them all. Now with Panover, uh, we can instantly sort of essentially reduce all the relevant paper uh, and uh, to actually a few dozens of candidate findings. And then uh, the human expert can uh, validate them uh, within an hour and already extract potentially an order of magnitude more facts uh, compared to uh, they have been able to do in the past. So this is very exciting. And we are now working on incorporating uh, machine reading into the end-to-end -end curation process and are now preparing a paper submission to report our findings. Going forward, the, the, most, the, the even more exciting prospect is to apply this machine reading into uh, electronic medical records to populate real-world evidence. And I've already make uh, quite significant progress in extract in, from uh, cancer registry, where we are now able to uh, extract uh, the core tumor attribute uh, for cancer patients, such as uh, tumor size, histology, staging, et cetera. And we are now starting to uh, uh, extract uh, additional information such as the treatment, adverse event, and also help matching them to clinical trials. So this is uh, these are the folks uh, who actually do the work. Uh, I would like also like to thank our uh, collaborator who have uh, been uh, inspired all our uh, work uh, all along. And without them, obviously, we can't do any of this. Thank you, and I look forward to uh, answer uh, questions and interact uh, both online and offline.